we'll get this thing started. Don't clap yet. You haven't seen anything. Um, all right, everyone. Welcome. Yes, take muffins, take books. There are such there is such a thing as a free uh, free muffins, I guess. Uh, now, welcome everyone. Uh, whether I've piqued your curiosity or incurred your wrath, we're glad that you came to this event. Uh, my name is Jack Butler. I'm the founder and president of the Fairfield Gadfly Group, which, for those of you who are aware and those of you who aren't, let's see if I have my little sheet of paper here. Yes, here it is. Um, the Fairfield Gadfly Group has a mission, and here it is. It's to agitate Hillsdale College's regnant conservative ethos, which too often limits and even prevents true understanding of the appeal and arguments of modern liberalism. Through fair, civil, and challenging debates, lectures, and discussions, the group will provide Hillsdale students with a healthy dose of the thoughtful provocation that would have faced them regularly at many other higher education institutions. This intellectual stimulation will refine students' own views, allow them to leave campus with a deeper understanding of opposing ideologies, and ultimately enable them to contest such ideas, both more reasonably and more effectively, both on and beyond Hillsdale's campus. So that's what we're all about here at the Fairfield Gadfly Group. And tonight, Dr. Steele of the Economics Department, yes. Go ahead. Tonight, Dr. Steele, as uh, you have seen from posters, has agreed to show us why, why freedom is, if not obsolete, needs at least some qualifications. Um, now, Dr. Steele, he is not... He's not a progressive authoritarian himself, at least that's what he claims. Uh, but he, he, he is interested in uh, exploring the weaknesses in his own arguments and uh, ultimately strengthening his own, his own positions. So since none of you really came here to hear me talk, let's, let's listen to Dr. Steele. Great. Well, thanks, Jack, and thanks to the Fairfield uh, Gadflies. Freedom is obsolete. <laughs> You're laughing, but it's just not a joke. Um, I'm going to do something tonight. I'm not going to give a speech. I've got a, a lot of notes here, but that's because I'm giving a lecture. I'm going to do this lecture style. But I'm going to present a case that a powerful authoritarian Regular, well, part, a, a progressive state is a necessity for the future. And now, it's going to be necessary if civilization is going to survive and if it's going to advance. And that's the case I'm going to make here. Um, now, what do I mean by an authoritarian uh, progressive state? Well, I've got something definitely very, very, very clear in mind here. This is going to have three parts to it. Uh, number one, a powerful regulatory state. Number two, a redistrib redistributive welfare state. And number three, a surveillance security state. Those three things together. And I see that a few of you are going, <laughs> Brady already thinks this is cool. He's going to be recruited in the <laughs> police state. So we'll watch those people. But I say freedom is obsolete. And I mean that, I mean that in a very precise way. In a simpler, poorer, less dangerous world, Freedom serves, it works really well. Okay, that's not the debate. What I'm talking about is a world that now has become more complex, more dangerous, and now that no longer works, or it has to be tempered greatly. Now, when Jack asked me to do this, I agreed to it, but I got to thinking about it, and I decided in making my case, I, do, I refuse to intentionally deceive you. I don't want to use any economic fallacies um, I don't want to make moral or philosophical arguments that, that you won't swallow, that I'm not going to try to change your ethics or something like that. Um, or no, I'm not going to use facts to try to deceive you. And that makes my case really difficult. This is Hillsdale College. I understand that almost nobody is going to be sympathetic to the kinds of arguments that I'm making. But what this means is, for example, I won't make any call for central economic planning. We know that central economic planning doesn't work. That's been known ever since certainly the Soviet Union collapsed. Everybody, you know, some of the, some of the main socialists, Robert Heilbronner admitted that. Um, I'm not going to, any policies that I advocate for redistributing wealth 
or for controlling people or anything like that has to take economic incentives into account. It has to be based on sensible economics. Okay, so we're not going to make up just, just crazy fairy tales. And I'm not going to make a moral argument, at least not primarily. That is, I'm not going to try to convert you to a moral viewpoint that you don't already hold. Okay, so I'm putting out a pretty difficult task for myself. And we'll see how this, how this works. But as an aside, I will say that many of you have a morality that says freedom is good. Now, if your morality leads you to support policies that in turn lead to damage or destruction of civilization, to bad consequences, then maybe you should question your morality. Because uh, your good intentions are not nearly as important as consequences. Consequences are really quite important. I think we all know that, right? Okay. <clears throat> good. Now that I've scared the heck out of you, I'll tell you something else. <laughs> this is a lecture. It's not a speech. Which means, as I typically when I lecture, I like to have people ask questions for points of clarification, or I might even, I'm not going to call on you guys, because I know you haven't done the reading in advance. But, uh, <laughs> but I don't know. Uh, but points of clarification, explanation, things like that. If you have questions, go ahead and at, during the during the talk at, or during my during my talk, ask me. If you want to debate or disagree in those terms, those are the questions to save for question and answer period, which we'll have. So, agreed? Everybody all set? I have prepared it because it's a lecture, and right here. So I'm going to talk about four different things, and this is the sequence, and this will kind of help organize the thinking. But I'm going to talk about market failures and why those need, those lead us to the need for a regulatory state, the growing income gap and the welfare state, the need for the welfare state, and then the growth of, I'm calling it individual power here, I wasn't quite sure what to say, but an increasingly dangerous world that calls for an increasing surveillance security state. Now I'm going to make this case. Great. So let's talk about market failures and regulation. Great place to start because I'm an economist and so the number of you are econ students. Many of you who aren't have still had basic econ. And so this should be kind of a, an interesting thing. <clears throat> Here's the basic argument. We know that private property rights, markets, market prices give the right incentives in some sense. We, they lead to coordination, cooperation, you know, you'll, entrepreneurs look at look at price discrepancies in the Austrian story, and they you know, take care of the uh, disequilibria. Smith's invisible hand. It works. OK, we know that. But we also know that it doesn't work perfectly, right? Let's see if I can get you to believe that. It's very well known, and it is well known, that there are unpriced effects. These unpriced effects, the economists uh, typically call them externalities. So those of you who have been in my courses know that I don't like the term externalities, but there it is, externalities, call them what you will. Unpriced effects. There are also things that we call problems of asymmetric information. Asymmetric information, I could simplify that by saying you know, it's a technical term, but it means a situation in buying and selling where one party has inside information that the other party doesn't have. So like a seller, in particular, a seller knows something about the good that he or she is selling, the buyer doesn't know. If the buyer knew what the seller knew, they wouldn't want to be part, any part of that deal. Okay, asymmetric information can be a problem. And another one would be systematic behavioral, uh, behavioral anomalies. So I'll, I'll explain these things here. My contention is that in an increasingly complex technological society, these things become much more serious than they used to be. And the implication is that with greater dangers, we need, need greater regulation, stricter regulation, and it calls for then a powerful regulatory state. And so let's, let me give you an example of this. Climate change. <coughs> now immediately, maybe 50%, right? I don't know. A number of you are going, oh yeah, but climate change, I don't believe in that. I don't care if you believe in climate change. It's not crucial that you do. But it's an example. It's the queen of all externality problems. If something like climate change is true, or something on that scale, uh, it's pretty difficult to see how a market can solve that problem. Uh, every factory owner who's contributing to the problem, every car driver, every person who's burning stuff in their fireplace or doing whatever, is contributing to the problem. But they directly benefit from using the atmosphere as a garbage dump. Great, they get direct benefits. 
and the consequences, the negative consequences, are down the, down the they're, they're later in time, and they're spread across many different people. So not an immediate cost to them, and not directly borne by them. And so they don't take that into account. Um, so anytime you have this problem of damages not being immediate, not traceable to any particular responsible party, uh, and spread over many people, you have these externality problems. There isn't any obvious way to get, the, get decision makers to take these into, the, into account. And if you've been in an econ class, you know that we call this the tragedy of the commons. Okay, tragedy of the commons. There's no question that that's a serious economic issue. It's true, that's, that's what is behind many, in fact, I would say all environmental problems. And we now are at a scale in the world where we have big ones. So let me give some examples. The ozone hole, okay? The Great, Pac Great Pacific Garbage Patch. You know what this one is? Uh, Great Pacific Garbage Patch, there's actually a number of them in the ocean, but places where plastic and other, it's mostly plastic, accumulates because of the ocean currents. And they get these things that are oscillating kind of fields that are like the size of France or something like that, that are just, just garbage. Uh, how about the destruction of ocean fisheries? Now some of those, like some people say, I don't believe in the ozone hole. I don't believe in climate change. I can tell you, I taught resource economics last term. And I think that there, you, you should have a fair amount of skepticism about some of the claims of environmental destruction. But not the ocean fisheries. That's really, that's a really serious problem. We do have the technological capability now with, with high capacity trawling techniques to wipe out fisheries. And we do it occasionally. More than 50% of the world's ocean fisheries are in some kind of jeopardy now. Um, what else? Urban air pollution. Okay, it's a real thing. We know that. Highly risky enterprises. Uh, uh, just think of Fukushima Daiichi or Chernobyl. And yes, I know that was a government operation. But that's not the point. The point is we humans can now do things on scale that can have genuinely destructive environmental effects. And we can really kill ourselves if we want to or if we aren't careful. <coughs> In 1787, when the U.S. Constitution was adopted, humans did not have the capability of generating externalities that would do damage on such a massive scale. But we do now. We have multiplied our ability to do this. And the market doesn't give the right incentives, in many instances, to take care of that. Okay. Great. <laughs> not great. Uh, all right, so I've got several pages on that. Let's, let's move to asymmetric information. Um, think about asymmetric information. And again, this, in some ways you could think of this, if you want to get into techno technical economics, you could think of this also as being a kind of externality problem. But asymmetric information is important with things like product safety. So think of food additives. Let me just give a, a, a sort of a hypothetical. Suppose you are an entrepreneur and you develop a food additive, a flavoring that you can put into food that makes it just so attractive to consumers that your sales will jump enormously. But you also know that it's got a side effect, that 20 years down the road, most of the people who consume that will develop a serious case of cancer. Uh, so you know it causes cancer, but that's not immediate damage. You also know it'll be very, no, no particular case of cancer can be traced to any particular cause. So you can get away with putting that in. 20 years down the road, you'll be off in the Bahamas or someplace spending all the, the cash you've got, and no one will be able to demonstrate that it was your additive that did it. Okay, great, that's a problem. Market pricing, that is, doesn't give the right incentives in that case. Okay, you can benefit by putting that stuff in and nobody will know. Um, this is a problem, we, I mean, it, advances in our technology are getting, we're getting better and better at designing chemicals that will have very powerful positive effects, but they also have negative effects, side effects. And you can't trust someone's, just their self-interest in the market in order to get them to do the right thing with it. We know that just from watching what drug companies have done. Pharmaceutical companies, it's well documented, have run uh, clinical trials on, on uh, uh, you know, medications that they've been developing. And when they put those trials out, 
they suppress the ones that showed bad results. They suppress the ones that showed negative side effects and just show the good ones. And then eventually that comes out and it's a scandal. Well, we know that those incentives exist. Um, one other, another example of asymmetric information and, a bad, and bad products, uh, we saw that in 2008 with the financial crisis, with financial products. If you look at the worst of the financial products that were sold, uh, the worst subprime, they were privately created. The worst subprime mortgages were generated privately. Those were taken by entre private entrepreneurs and converted into mortgage-backed securities, the worst <laughs> mortgage-backed securities, which were then, by private agencies, rated AAA. Those things were then turned into, or used to generate, uh, the, the worst market or the, the worst mortgage-backed security derivatives were built upon those things. Okay, and the whole thing was done by private uh, private operators who knew that then they could turn around and sell them to someone as AAA to unwitting investors. Great, and that happened. And we know that that, ha that happened. The story here is that with asymmetric information. If you can get away with passing it off, you might get away with making a, a fortune. And so in some, sometimes these harmful destructive goods can be, can be produced. And we're getting into a situation I mean, with modern understandings of these things that becomes easier and easier to generate that sort of stuff. Um, so let me say just briefly something about <coughs> this idea of systematic behavioral anomalies. People will often choose things that they would, that, that are, that they are, that are, people will often, when they're making choices, consumers say, will choose things that are bad for them. That if they were to sit down and think about it rationally for a second, they say, well, I wouldn't choose that. I wouldn't do that. But that's not the way this stuff is presented, choices are presented to them. So it's well known that when you walk into a supermarket, the layout of the supermarket will affect the things that you buy. Okay, there's a reason why when you're at the checkout stand, there's candy bars there, not carrots. They put the carrots somewhere else. Okay? The carrots are out on, the, on that one, one side or the other. This is a systematic way of laying out a supermarket because the impulse buying stuff is in the middle where people are likely to walk on the first, first go around. Um, great, well more importantly, people can be manipulated into bad choices. And as we increase our understanding of human psychology, we get better, or marketers get better and better at doing that. Um, and so we see things like unsustainable consumer debt growing. If you learn nothing else from what I'm saying tonight, let me tell you that borrowing for consumption is usually a totally insane thing to do. Don't do it. Okay? But Americans are doing that increasingly. Okay? We have unsustainable consumer debt as a result. Uh, what else? Obesity. That's not good for you. But we are have it hardwired into us through evolution or something that our bodies are, are, are made, they're set in our minds to store calories. And so in the times when, back in the old days when food was scarce, when it was available, we'd eat like crazy, store up calories be, for the bad times. But now we don't have those bad times. We have, a pro, we have a constant stream of calories and especially cheap junk calories that we keep eating, people, we, but people keep eating and eating and eating and so we have a obesity growing. It's wired into us to respond this way to these foods. Um, addictions, if you can generate addictions in people, you get re repeat sales. Okay, enough said about that. This increased understanding of psychology means that we get better and better, or marketers get better and better at pushing these kinds of things. There's more scope for manipulation of people. Yeah, David. Okay, uh, do you think that the, I guess the increased um, do you think that also has to do with, say, 50 years ago with our, I guess, morality overall, with uh, some of these choices would not have been made as often um, if people had a higher degree of morals, uh, if, they, if they paid attention more to the news, if they weren't just um, looking at um, the 30 minute clip and actually going in and looking at the whole speech and the context of it. So I'm saying, is, would, if, if, our, if we had a higher, uh, more moral uh, citizens in, in the government, do you think they would make is the decline of morality, I guess, part of uh, why people are making bad choices? No, I don't think, well, I, at least not in the, kind of the context I'm talking about. Like people okay. making bad choices about, like I'm buying, 
I'm buying a bad derivative because I didn't know any better, or I'm eating too much, you know, I'm, blown, I'm being manipulated well, into... I guess, I guess more for the externalities of really black companies deciding to develop these, these kind of drugs and um, they're deciding to, uh, I guess, improve the environment. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I can think about that, maybe have an answer, but in every one of these instances that I've just pointed out, the free market generates does not give the right incentives to the entrepreneur, to the businessman, to the decision maker. The solution then would be a regulatory state. Okay? It's got to be some, some sort of external solution if there's not an internal one. And so then the resp you'd need regulatory bodies with two things. Number one, they'd have responsibility for overseeing safety and well-being. And number two, they'd have to have the power or the authority for enforcement of that. Okay, so that means powerful regulatory bodies. That's not, that's, that's part of the progressive state. That's the first part of it. Something I'll also say is that a crucial point in all of this, since I'm talking about people being manipulated, is what we would call, what, what Cass Sunstein uh, has called the uh, design of choice architecture. Choice architecture is the framework that individuals are presented with to make decisions. Um, so an example of this, uh, just, just and there are many examples, but one would be, for example, say we have people right now can think about setting up a retirement account, but it's optional. Okay. Great. The default is you don't have one. Sunstein's idea is that that's the wrong choice architecture. Instead, everybody should automatically be enrolled in one, and then if you wanted to opt out, that's the default is that you're in and you opt out. Okay, so there he's, he's set up a regulation. He's designed the choice architecture without really using force in it or something. But design of choice architecture <coughs> is crucial here because that sets the incentives that people face. And in particular, the supervisory bodies themselves need to have the right choice architecture. So instead of thinking about how to get the free market to work, we need to think about how to set up the regulatory state and get these guys to have the right incentives. Okay. That's the, that's, that's, that would be the, the, the solution. Right. Let me go on to the next problem. Um, the growing income gap and how we're going to resolve that. Now, everyone's heard this, you know, the Occupy movement is out marching around about this growing income gap, and you see, see it all the time in the news, and, 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 and discussions of it. So there's growing in income inequality, and there are many reasons for it. And some of them are transitory, some are policy related, some you might do something, you know, tweak some tax rates or do something else and they'll go away or, you know, or whatever. But here's a central one that's a real problem. The modern information economy is creating a growing divide between those people who can handle information those who cannot. So when I say can handle information, I'm thinking about things like those who could do mathematics and programming, those who can handle data and statistics, wordsmiths, you know, those who can handle, handle words, words and language. So the English majors, the, the marketing majors and people like this. Uh, strategic and tactical uh, planning and thinking, things like that. That's where the future is. And the people who have high-level, abstract, conceptual thought are the ones who thrive in the modern economy, and it's going to be increasingly true. The people who can do it will be winners. The people who can't, losers. <coughs> and at least to, uh, to uh, certainly to some extent, that's genetic. That's, there's, these are differences in the, in the differences that are inherent in people. Increasingly, Simply providing physical effort is not going to be very valuable. That's decreasingly valuable in the economy. So unskilled labor has already been left behind. Okay, forget it for them. Skilled labor, the human ability to monitor tasks, monitor the you know, tasks, that still exceeds oftentimes what a machine can do. But that's being lost as well, as machines get better and better at monitoring uh, things. So the implication is that there's a growing income gap that's inherent in the structure of our economy that's going to be between the people who can handle high-level conceptual thought, us, all, everybody here, because we're, call, we're you know, at a place like this, versus those who cannot do it. That's a growing gap. Now, 
that also means a growing underclass. And I could now start saying there's a moral argument, we have to do something, it's an immoral imperative, but I'm not going to make a moral argument. But it will tell you that if there's a growing underclass, uh, it threatens civilization. That underclass has very little interest in the system. They have no stake in it. It generates resentment. It generates class warfare. It generates divisiveness and then what? Neo-Marxism, conflict, uh, you know, revolution, something like this, political turmoil. It's not a stable situation. So yeah, you have to do something, even if it's just for consequentialist reasons. Um, and what can you do about this? Well, before I get to that, at the same time that there's this growing income gap, the nature of what's going on in the economy also means that some things are going to be increasingly priced out of the reach of the people who don't have a lot of money. And in particular, I'm thinking about health care. I'm looking at the time, thinking how much I, I, I'll, I'll talk about, about this. Increasingly, decent health care is going to be out of reach in terms of price of the working poor and the lower middle class. So imagine telling people, great, we have new technology, we've got new techniques, and the, you know, the intelligentsia, or whatever, we, whatever, whoever we are, we can afford it, we get it. But you guys can't afford it, so sorry, you're going to die. Your life will not be as long as, it, as ours will because you don't have access to this technology. Yeah, Nick. Did, uh, what constitutes like, decent health care? Is, is that going to change is, as technology increases? Yes. Okay. It does change. Yeah, it definitely does. I'm gonna, let me say a little more about this. But what this does is throw gasoline on that, on that already burning fire of in, inequality if we have a problem like this. Um, I guess I've got a thing to do and I can time. So why would health care be getting expensive and, inc and growing in price? And there are many reasons for this. But we know that from 1960 to 2000, that 40 year span, spending per person on health care went up 10 times. That's real terms. So it's nothing to do with inflation. Just in real terms, the average spending went from, uh, uh, well, grew 10 times. I don't have any, any exact numbers here. Now, many reasons for that, but the number one reason is the growth of technology. Increased technological advance, and it's very easy to demonstrate that that technological advance also generated great benefits. In in the, in, just before 1960, if you had a heart attack, you're diagnosed with this, basically it was a death sentence. There wasn't much they could do. And today, well, there's all kinds of things you can do. It's got to be pretty severe before it wipes you out. We can re, you know, re-put re people back together with this. Um, uh, uh, I, I can give citations on some of this research uh, as, to, as to whether it really is generating benefits, but it is. Um, there's a problem that, the, that, 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 that uh, appears here. Health care is subject to what William ba well, what I will call Baumol's cost disease. There's an economist at uh, Princeton University and NYU, William Baumol, who uh, I think is the first one to point this out. And he, he showed that, I mean, we know that in most industries, the technological advance makes goods cheaper. So you think about a calculator. The first engineering hand calculators would cost, in today's terms, for what a calculator that might be $50 back then in today's money would be $2,000. Prices go down for technology. We know that. It doesn't happen in healthcare. Why is that? Anyone know? It's because healthcare has something about it that is a little different. Advances in technology and medicine mean that you in also need increasing amounts of the single most expensive input that there is. And that most expensive, most scarce input is human capital and human labor. Okay? You need highly trained, highly skilled technicians, doctors, nurses, all kinds of people to use the new technology. It becomes more expensive for that reason. Um, and so in that sense, because it takes more and more and more human capital, the scarcest resource, healthcare prices are doomed to grow faster than other prices. And that prices it out of the reach of the lower, the lower income people. Great, not great. Good that I made my point, but uh, it's, it's, it's bad news. It's, what's the solution? 
it is a redistributive welfare state because these people cannot generate the wealth that they need in order to live in such a society. Um, you need to re redistribute wealth, and not the way it's done today. It has to go from the wealthy to the less wealthy, which is not all the way, all the way it always works. You've got to reduce the gap, and you've got to give the losers in a society a stake in it through a welfare state. But secondly, you also have to do it in ways that do not generate bad incentives. So you just hand out free stuff to everybody, and then they become lazy, and they don't try to, try to get hit. So that's a mistake. But to not generate bad incentives, first of all, what, do you, what should you do? In some way, subsidize the heck out of education to at least try to push people up higher or help them climb up higher. What else? Heavily subsidize health care, because that's one thing that is not going to be accessible to people. Something else would be to subsidize the heck out of Social Security, because people often are not going to be able to provide for themselves in old age. Um, you want to do it in ways that do not create bad incentives, and I know I'm not going to belabor this, but there are probably ways to do that, but it will require, you know, in some cases, maybe vouchers or something. Hang on, Brady, just get to it in a second. Um, uh, you, might, you will need very heavy monitoring in the way people use things. Like with the EBT cards today, people go out and buy cigarettes and booze. You don't want that. So you've got to control their behavior to make sure they do the right thing. Yeah? Um, when you subsidize something, you make it cheaper for the every man to get access to it. Um, wouldn't subsidizing the education system more so than we already do just cause it to be a bubble and eventually the college degree will mean as little as the high school degree does today. How, would, is there a way to get around that? Or? Well, I think that's because they're subsidizing things in the wrong way. What we're doing now, uh, let, me, let me hold off on explaining what, what I think is wrong with education today. But yeah, if you do things in the wrong way, all you do is generate bubbles and you, you get perverse behavior. If you, if you see homeless people and you give them, I mean, there's a homeless person, give them a bunch of money, you're not going to get them out of, the, out of the homeless situation doing that. They go off and buy booze and drugs and stuff like this, so it's not going to help. It's got to be done the right way. What would That's, the right way be? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I actually don't know. But if I give him money, maybe I can also monitor him and say, look, buddy, if you, you know, the iron hand of the state could also say, it's the gentle glove of the state. We're going to lead you down the path. <laughs> We're going to give you education. If you, want, uh, if you want free stuff, it's not free. You also go through some sort of counseling and re-education or something. I don't know. The, the full architecture of this, I'm not going to lay, out, lay that out tonight. I don't think I'll be able to. Will that be uh, next week in half? <laughs> <laughs> Let me give a longer term solution because here's something that's very innovative. If we're thinking about this problem of the in income gap, how about this? James Juncker, an uh, economist at Western Illinois University, came up, uh, wrote a book called Socialism Revised and Modernized. And I'm, his, it's a big book, so he's got this laid out. Let me give that a few details, uh, highlights rather. He says that when his goal is to have socialism, but he says central planning doesn't work. We understand that. So we can't have central planning, but how could we possibly have public property, get rid of this private property that is creating this huge income gap? He says, here's, what it, here's his solution. When corporations reach a certain size, as defined maybe by uh, gross revenues or maybe by profits, they become public property. Now we're not just confiscating them, we purchase them from the owners so we're not generating bad incentives. But they get big enough, we purchase them and they become public property. They now stay, they belong to all the citizens. The managers of these things will then receive a share of the profit, profits that they earn. And so how much they get paid depends on how much they, how profitable the corporation is, right? So they still have a, an incentive to maximize the profit and to do the right thing in the marketplace. No subsidies. So the firm can go bankrupt if they make mistakes. It can be closed down if they make mistakes. So it's got the right incentives and it's not centrally planned. But all the remaining profits then go into the public, go to the public. And at the end of the, end of the year, those have all in the treasury, maybe some goes to the general fund, but the state then writes a check to every single citizen, splitting up the dividend, the dividend, the profit even, e equally across all citizens. Great. It's, it's publicly owned. 
and everybody's a stakeholder in this situation. It reduces the income inequality. And you might think, wow, that's far-fetched. Well, they already do this in Alaska. Okay, they already do it in Alaska with oil, oil, oil revenues, the taxes and the uh, property taxes and taxes on oil revenues go into, a, into the Alaska Permanent Fund, and out of that they write a check to every resident of Alaska at the end of the year and everybody gets paid. They already do this. All right, great. So, one more, one more. We've got the welfare state established. What about this one? And this is the, maybe, for me, the scariest one. Advancing technology and increasing personal income are a deadly combination. That might not sound right to you, but it's, listen, think about this. 3% annual growth rate in per capita income. Uh, if everybody's income goes up 3% annually, which is not unreasonable number, that means that in 24 years your, life, your income doubles. Over your working lifetime, that means a quadrupling of your income. Wow, that's cool, isn't it? Yeah, that's great. Not only that, for many kinds of, many kinds of technology, of course, prices we know are going down. So you can afford more and more and more of the more advanced technology. It puts enormous power into the hands of individuals and small groups. So think of 3D printing. 3D printer, everyone, well maybe you don't know, Cody Wilson, the guy with the Wiki we Weapons Project, printed an AR-15 and bam, 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 and it worked. Okay? I'm not scared of that. I mean, big deal. You can buy a rifle anyway. Okay? But with a 3D printer at home, with a computer, you can make a firearm. How about this? With a 3D printer making biological weapons, like viruses, or making chemical weapons, ricin. Yeah, that stuff is not science fiction. Uh, Foreign Affairs magazine, one year ago this, this month, had an article on 3D, 3D printing. And it was one of the things they pointed out that is a great threat from this, the possibility of someone actually being able to print a designer bioweapon, like a virus, with biological printing. I mean, this stuff is not science fiction. It's, it's already being worked on. Um, you might not do that in your own home, but a small group could do it. Other kinds of homemade mayhem potential, weaponized drones and robots, black hat hacking potential, say that 10 times really fast. Uh, that, those kinds of things, coupled with increased vulnerability of our system, so things like our finance and money supply and banking, which is now all electronic, or power grids, or water, or pipelines, or driverless cars, we're gonna get those soon. Great, hack into something like that, and think how much mayhem a high school kid could do at home once they learned how to do this. Okay, these are genuine threats. Think about an Adam Lanza or an Osama bin Laden with access to increasingly advanced technology. You tell me that's not scary. A disaffected teenager won't have to go and get a shotgun and go to school when he's, when he's mad at his classmates. He can sit home with his computer and fly his drone up at school. He may not even get caught. Okay, this is really, uh, uh, I mean, this is real stuff. So the problem is that the exponential growth in the ability of individuals and small, root, small units, small groups to commit mayhem that could shut down or do tremendous damage to society, plus the increasing vulnerability of society. Okay, I hope that scared the heck, well, it scares the heck out of me because the solution seems to me to be, what is it? It's the security state. Okay, first of all, it's an end to privacy as we know it. The re it's certainly the repeal of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, careful monitoring of the, of the public, we're already getting that. And some people are gonna call it a police state, but you've gotta have some kind of a security state that is dedicated to public safety and public security. Great. How would we prevent the security state from becoming something like the Gestapo or Shazi? That's a really good question. It's an important question. In fact, this is what my conclusion sort of is, because I may not have quite the answer. But remember that I just said this is the necessity of this stuff, and I think I just established the necessity. Um, we have the necessity of a benevolent, authoritarian <laughs> state 
It's going to be comprised by powerful regulatory bodies, very strong welfare state, and a very strong surveillance and security state. The US, I'll say something else. This is not utopian. This is not Marx's utopia or something like this. This is something, I think, a lot more like what the German historical school was asking for with, with Prussia. They were well ahead of their time in some sense, uh, in that sense. This is kind of the Bismarck, Bismarck's dream fulfilled, perhaps. The US Constitution was fine for a time when the primary way for individuals to organize to do antisocial things was through the state. But that was a different time. Okay, right now, it isn't the state that we're worried about so much. It's these kinds of problems. The Constitution was fine for a time when almost anyone could, if they really put themselves to it, do really well for themselves, when we didn't have a need for that, when we didn't have this growing income, this, this, this divide. It was fine for a time when you market failures, externalities were minor things, but that's a different time. And so we have a very different set of problems now and limited government, freedom in the sense of the free individual in the sharply constrained state is obsolete. The powerful regulatory welfare security state is necessary and the question before us today that you just raised is how do we design it? to give it benevolent tendencies, and that's the thing we should be studying. Questions? Uh, okay, I want to kind of go back to your first point. Uh, I assume we're living in a democracy still where we, the people will be electing our uh, politicians to institute this regulatory <laughs> state. Uh, so, but if we, the people, um, are so easily manipulated by the candy bars at the you know, gas station or the grocery store, if we're so short-sighted that we don't even bother to really do any research into where we stick our investments, and, uh, you know, we don't even bother to look on Yelp and I'm going to get food poisoning at this restaurant. Uh, what's the like this? Why when we go to the uh, polls every no every other November? Or are we all of a sudden going to elect politicians who are going to be manipulating us? How are we going to be not short-sighted? And how are we not going to be just you know, lacking the information when we go to vote for politicians in, in our daily lives? Like said, so you're suggesting that democracy has to go too. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, I don't want really to see how you can have it both ways. Anyway. You might be right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe democracy has to go whether we don't have a totalitarian state or not. So that's real here. <laughs> I, I should probably say this isn't necessarily the totalitarian state because oh, there sorry. are spheres of no, I'm choice. Not I mean, but you get the point. I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to be like, all right, this, is, this will be the true art in this moment. Yes? But is it even <clears throat> democratic or representative democracy at all anymore? Because if we have this huge regulatory state, which we don't elect, which is protecting us, is it even really representative government, or is it just, I don't even know what to call it, but can we even call it that anymore? It's become something totally different. I mean, I don't even think we should, I think, I mean, maybe is freedom obsolete? I don't, maybe we're still somewhat free, but I don't even think we should call it democracy anymore. It's something totally different. So there, the, when I say is freedom obsolete, and again, I said I said at the outset that this wouldn't be saying that we're going to abolish private property, abolish markets and market trading or something like that. I think that would be wrong. But it's got to be sharply constrained. That's what I'm saying. So with sharp constraints, it's not the free society. It's not what we say when we say, here's the end of the, you know, the, individual liberty and the inviolable rights of the individual. No, that stuff, that gets constrained. People will still have a sphere of, of uh, you know, sphere of choice or something like this. I didn't really answer your question, but, but I don't have an answer either. Um, yes, go ahead. Well, in the spirit of Ayn Rand's I Was Shrug, um, <laughs> what will incentivize the financial benefactors who are burdened with the great cost of this new this new um, regime. So you're talking about the wealthy people who are generating, who, who are, well, that's actually one possible reason why this idea from Juncker would be good because they're, in that case, it's not being, it's not say through taxes or redistribution in that sense. Um, I'll say a little bit more about Juncker's, Juncker's point. But on, the, but on the, uh, in another sense, there is an answer to that. 
and that's that I just gave you a consequentialist argument. Your, your alternative is to, okay, great, we're gonna fortify ourselves because when the, when the starving masses or the, when, you know, when the political turmoil comes, we're gonna have to protect ourselves from it. So your, your choices maybe are a society of civil war versus a society of you know, peaceful redistribution. It won't be so much that everybody's gonna be completely equalized, we know that too. You'll still have the, the haves and the haves nots, but you'll reduce that gap. Paul Krugman has not called for the thing that I'm calling for here, but he certainly called for uh, policies that would redistribute income. He's been pretty clear about this. He says that we have this growing gap and we need to re re reduce it through, <coughs> some of his ideas would fit in with what I've said, maybe some wouldn't, but through tax policies and education policies and subsidies that will reduce that gap. So it's not that you've lost everything and now you're equal and you don't have any benefit from having, you know, worked harder or whatever, but it's not as big. Progressive taxation is an example. Is everybody going to go on strike, go to Galt's Gulch, and figure out what to do? Uh, let's see, there was somebody else who had had a question. And I, yes? Uh, in what way are we not already living in this type of society? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know where the benevolent part went. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Let's put it this way. I think we are slowly moving towards this, maybe. But I don't think we're there yet. We certainly, we have a growing income gap. We don't have this welfare state. We have little bits and pieces of it. Much of the, much of the redistribution goes on. It goes on from the poor, or it, it goes to the, from the politically weak to the politically powerful is the way it works today. So you can see, you know, Goldman Sachs is a major recipient of government largesse in some sense. So, and if you look at uh, Archer Daniel Midland, big agribusiness and things like this, um, that's not exactly the kind of welfare that I'm talking about here. That probably answers at least partly. Um, yes? Uh, you mentioned uh, asymmetric information as like, a really mm -hmm. big problem. And I, I'm curious as to like, uh, you mentioned how people will use uh, something that they know that they don't to make a fortune, basically, or or they will um, they use the food like drug a drug with a side effect. Uh, what is to say that the people are who are going to be in power? Some, I'm assuming somebody's going to be in charge, or some a group of people will be in charge. Even if we have to throw out democracy, there's got to be somebody who's in charge. What's to stop them? I mean, there is still, I mean, I think it's safe to say that people are generally self-focused. Um, so these guys are self, so the, so the, who's going to want, who's going to guard the guardians? Basically, that's what, I, that's what I'm wondering, because who's this, I, I don't think that this problem of asymmetric information is necessarily going to go away. It's not going to go away. The point is to regulate it or something like this. This is actually, I kind of wanted to get at this when I started said something about, what about, about these regulatory agencies. They need to have the right incentives, too. I mean, if you go back, I teach history of economic thought. So you go back and look at some of the people who first came up with these, with these ideas. But Adam Smith even talked about like a regulatory body that would manage roads. And he said, well, get some of the most respectable citizens who would be embarrassed if the roads are in bad shape. And they will, you know, they're upstanding people in the community. And they'll help monitor the condition of the roads. A.C. Pagu said, look, get experts. and." This sort of thing, and they'll be able. It, Pagu was around the turn of the 19th, or sorry, turn of the 20th century, and he, he advocated things like uh, things that we would now think of like Consumer Product Safety Commission, mm -hmm. things like this, regulatory bodies. And he said, get experts on, and experts who we would hope would be interested in public welfare. How do you select them? Not quite sure, but Cass Sunstein's work in uh, in thinking about. Uh, uh, choice architecture. How do you set up the incentives in your body so that these people will have the right incentive to do what's aligned their interest with what the is also in the public interest? So it's not just any old regulatory welfare security state, because that could be a nightmare, but one where we also tailor those internal institutions within the, or internal rules within the agencies so that the people will behave in ways that are good for us. How do you guarantee that? There are no guarantees, of course. Yes? I was wondering, first, could you 
remind you of that book that work you cited? What? The we, Modern Socialist one? Socialism. James Yunker? Yeah. I, yes. James, his name is James Yunker. Socialism Revised and Modernized. Okay. And then based on that, what you said about that, um, I was wondering, like the modern tax system already disincentivizes business owners to, from going over certain tax thresholds. Mm -hmm. So how is he, what's his argument for people remaining just under the right. government buyout? I cannot remember. It's okay. a while since I, I, I read it and I can't find my copy of it now. But he does talk about these kinds of things. But that's why it's a government buyout, so at least you're not totally, I mean, you're not totally goofed if you, if you do it. Okay. Um, so he's trying to, and those people who, the entrepreneur who founded the business may yet, may then act, actually be the person who then becomes the manager of it. Okay. And so he's still getting profit from it. Gotcha. I just feel like he would still try to remain right underneath and then succeed for in the long term and maintain, like, I feel like that, what, that income gap is going to be maintained because entrepreneurs are going to be There will be some income gap. There's no doubt about it. It's not going to go away. Yeah. The point is to shrink it so that it's not, like, okay. the extremely wealthy and the extremely poor, and there's, that's trouble. Okay. I just, entrepreneurs are a hard enemy to fight. Hard, entrepreneurs are not an enemy. Oh, I, I'm not I, saying they are. Junker, even, Junker says, absolutely, do nothing to interfere with entrepreneurship. Okay. If somebody gets a new good idea, well, that's where they come from. And so they start their business, and you don't goof around with that unless it gets up to that size where then you buy them out. Gotcha. Okay, uh, James. Well, as an answer to the previous question about the margins, it would seem to me that you could simply set the buyout price high enough that it would actually be a goal the entrepreneur would want to achieve so he could have that massive payoff rather than having to earn it piecemeal over many years. I know many entrepreneurs who that's their, I mean, that's their golden moment is when their business is big enough that somebody wants to buy it from them and they can go start a new one or do something else. I'll try to make this a simple yet yeah, question. So before the uh, national security state, at least we have today, you know, the assumption was always innocent until proven guilty. And, and in terms of that, uh, um, that the government had to prove beyond reasonable doubt that you did something in order to throw you in jail. And now after uh, the more national security state that we have, it's becoming more of a, we, are, we have the security state to help prove your innocence rather than prove your guilt. Um, so are you saying that in, um, that Americans or who, whatever country we're speaking of, um, are, just need to accept the fact that their privacy is going to be, is going to look incredibly different or almost, and be almost non-existent in this new state in exchange for the security from the 3D bonds. Is that a fair assessment of what, of what you were trying to say? I think so, if I understood what you're saying. I, I don't know about the innocent till proven guilty sort of thing, but I do think that you know, the idea that you're going to, you can't investigate anything or even, even look at anything until you get a search warrant. And right now we do this, you know, NSA does this stuff under a FISA authorization. So they're pretending that they're spying on all of us because it's, you know, they're looking for foreign terrorists, but come on. Um, it's, it has very little to do with foreigners. And it's simply a matter of, look, you can't afford it anymore. Uh, Portia. Um, you may have already covered this, so I'm sorry, but um, you talk, I keep hearing correct incentives and getting the incentives just right. We're not in a totalitarian state, but we're also not eliminating private property. Um, that sounds to me very costly in a bunch of different ways. How are you, what, how do you think this? So it's not just, uh, first of all, it's not, it's not getting it, per there's no such thing as perfect. I mean, I really don't believe there's any such thing as the, the perfect society or perfect structure or anything like that in these, these human things. Um, so what I'm, let's put it this way, if, I, if I'm sitting down and writing a new constitution, I want to get it more or less right. I want to get the right incentives, the right limits, or whatever, all through that thing. But it's going to mean, so I don't know, it's more, more costly to get it right than to get it wrong in the term that you're talking about. You're talking about enforcement. In by what sense? What do you mean? Like by default, <laughs> with, like enforcing what you say we should be enforced, be more costly than just not, or would it not be more costly? 
Well, if you think that uh, if we if we do if we don't do this, what I've suggested is that we're going to have massive externality problems that could, you know, some of these things would would destroy the environment or have other kinds of nasty consequences, on a very very big scale. If we don't do anything about this, we get a growing income gap that leads to political instability uh, and other other kinds of problems maybe. And with this one, we get you know these people who are become politically unstable also can destabilize everything. Yes? Um, assuming your economic analysis of all this is correct, which I won't deny, um, and also recognizing the uh, self-evidence of the uh, right to liberty, should we not abandon this um, large state as fundamentally immoral by the uh, principle specifically of Socratic morality that it is always better to suffer evil than to do it. That is, would it not be morally just to uh, abide within the natural right of liberty even if it were to cost the um, destruction of civilization and uh, the world so, entire. Fiat justitia, my Latin's terrible, fiat justitia et periat mundus. Let justice be done, though the world be destroyed. Exactly. So we're perished. Uh, you know, if, some, if you say that that's better, I don't have an argument here against that. But I will say that I'm kind of skeptical that a morality that leads you to the destruction of the world is better than a morality that says, no, we're not going to destroy human life or human civilization. I would say it's one that allows it rather than produces it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yes. <laughs> 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 the tendency of those possessed of social capital, social and economic capital, to try to preserve their holdings and the kind of the circumstantial inadequacy of a lot of those not possessed of social capital to raise themselves up. How much social mobility would be? Okay, so you're so so. I thought you were going. I thought you were asking a different question when you started asking asking this. So now I'm a, a little bit lost. But you, actually, what I was t talking about was human capital, which is maybe a little bit different from social capital. But the idea is your knowledge, your skills, your ability to handle <coughs> to do things. So the people who are high skill versus low skill, or high capital, low capital. Social capital, I think of as more being about connections and things like this. But again, being able to operate within society is probably a part of this human capital I'm talking about, high social skills. So that, so your question was, how, how much of a gap is, is acceptable, or how much mobility? How feasible is transfer between the two between I'm not exactly certain on that. There's actually economic research done on, on <coughs> economics. Economists do research everything because we think we know everything. But economists research this, but also psychologists, people in other <coughs> fields, education. And so the extent to which you can, these things aren't genetic or can be changed through transfers, I, I can't quite tell you. But they can, at least somewhat. And so that's part of the reason for this idea of a, you know, this, this welfare state. That's why I said education would be something that you would want to generate. There's a, well, I, I just saw something last night that was really interesting about this, but if I talked about it, it doesn't contribute, but I'll, I'll give you a, if you want to ask me afterwards, I'll show you a, web, uh, a little piece on a website that was kind of about that, about differing degrees of social mobility across different cities, and they're trying to figure out what causes it in the United States, and also different countries. So if I'm understanding you correctly, there's been a progression since the Constitution was written um, in the late 1700s, it was good for them, but there's been a progression, so it's not good for now, and so we need this regulatory state, you know, not necessarily tyranny, but we need a change. So I guess my question is, what's to stop that progression from continuing? So we know that hum humans are advancing, technology is getting better, um, you know, the enemies are getting smarter, the bombs are getting deadlier, all these things are happening. What's to stop the regulators from having to regulate our lives so much and learning so much in psychology and medicine and all these things 
to basically create perfect lives for us that are perfectly safe, that are perfectly sustainable, all these things. So we have a situation that's kind of like Brave New World, which is kind of, this is, it's a little bit of an incredible situation, but we're talking about a progression here. And so what's to say 100 years down the road that it hasn't gotten worse and thus we need more regulation and we just reach a certain point where we, we can't even tell, we, we, we would look at it and we wouldn't even be able to see where we were in the 1700s, it'd just be so different. There's pretty much no freedom at all. Yeah. That's a good question. I'm not sure that I have an answer to that. I would, I would Nick does. I mean, no, <laughs> Does anyone here have a problem with central people bumble puppy? I think that the state can virtually plan our lives for us and make us, you know, euphoric at every more moment. Then you know, more power to it. <laughs> so, so the economist, the economist. Well, I wonder if that's you know, central people bumble puppy. I think the possibility is a problem here. So, so first I would. I, I do think that this is that these things might be growing. This one, for example, might be a growing issue, and that yeah, it will require increasing amounts of something to deal with that. Let me. There was someone else who had a an answer on that. I think civilization is a wash, and we should go back to hunting and gathering. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually not a very hard sell for me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but at any rate, <laughs> yes. um, in order to create an efficient regulatory state, wouldn't we have to incentivize our brightest and smartest people to uh, be on the regulator side than on the market side? So as a consequence, wouldn't that create a very stale society that doesn't innovate? I don't think we. I don't think that's an either or kind of thing. I think some I, 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 some people will go into into. Well, first, I guess the answer is no because some people would go into into this kind of thing. Some people prefer to be entrepreneurs or do whatever you know research. Is. It's not that this is all that's going to be left. There's the whole rest of the economy that some people want into the information economy. Um, the way this works now is, of course, now I don't want to go. I don't want to go that way. That's 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 too, too much. I'll get off on. I'll get. I'll digress too much. But think of it this way: the people who are, who say become these these you know, socialist managers here of these socialist firms may well have been the entrepreneurs who started the thing in the first place. So one might move from place to place back and forth in this society. Those are not set things. So I don't think it necessarily has to be that way. Yes. Isn't he isn't he proposing exactly what Ann Ryan wrote about? I mean, the government came into Reardon's office and said, "We're here to buy your metal, and I don't want to sell it. It's mine." No, we're giving you a good price. You have to sell. And I just think, uh, you know, what what you're talking about. I, I think the property rights has what is what has created this income gap. I mean, compare our poor to the poor in other countries. And there's the large income gap. So you're you're taking you're taking what's created all this wealth, and you're trying to make us look more like them, so that there's less of a difference between the rich and the poor. I guess. So I, I'm I'm pretty sympathetic to the point that you know private. Well, first, private property rights are what are what you know if they could get this in some some you know undeveloped third world country and get solid the property rights. They can begin developing. So I haven't said that for that undeveloped state, this doesn't work. Um, I haven't said the private property rights don't, don't work. But I suggested that there's a way, when these things get big, that you can transfer to public property without doing too much damage. There would be some consequent, negative consequences to this, potentially. A Hank Reardon won't go for this deal. A Hank Reardon's going to blow up his, you know, he's going to be like, uh, uh, who's the architect in Fountainhead? He'll, he'll, um, Howard Rourke. Howard, he'll be like a Howard Rourke and just blow off his plant or something rather than let, this, let that happen, the state get it. But that's probably not what most people or everyone's going to do. Again, I know entrepreneurs whose, whose deal is they get the thing going and then they sell it off and they go start a new one. That's what they live for. Can I get a new business idea going and make it grow? So yeah, you might lose some, but you gain some other. Okay. 
It's a, it's a, it's a trade off. That's what Younger says. Michael. Um, so ultimately, um, in order to solve all these issues, because that's just, we're talking just about national government. Do we ultimately need an international government to stop you know, climate change? And yeah, probably. So probably. <laughs> probably so. Uh, not a democracy yeah. either. <laughs> yeah, we'll all vote on it. <laughs> is, is, there like, is there a consensus here that democracy is a, is a good thing? No, I, no, no, I mean, you know, okay. there's represent, like, they think that freedom and property rights and representative government are not necessarily, you know, the same thing, but perhaps, perhaps they could be, you know, necessarily complement to one another. You know, let me just say something before I take more questions. But if you find, I mean, I, I think I talked about, it. I don't think I made up a single problem that I talked about that we're facing. And I don't think I really exaggerated the scale or the scope of it. And if you don't like this regulatory welfare security state solution, yeah, well, what solution do you have? And I've only heard two so far. And one of them is to let civilization destroy itself, and the other is to go back to the hunter gatherers. Perhaps. My solution would be instead of looking forward, perhaps we should look backwards. Because as long as one person exists on this earth with the freedom, and, and a soul and heart that's inspired by the principles of living in our family, then there's hope. Because one person is, is capable of extraordinary things. And is it not time for us to abandon these idle theories of, and awaken from our deceitful dream of a golden age of perfect wisdom and happy virtue? It appears to be a too good opinion on human nature to suggest that such a regime can long endure against the sense of freedom and liberty within our hearts. And how much blood will need to be spilled for such a regime for such a regime to properly be established? And how will this regime manage the resistance? Well, here's my question. I, I guess you're you're saying that that would be the. Uh, I guess I don't quite. How does that solve any of the problems that I've talked about here? Well, the thing. Well, the thing is, we live in this this new age of science and all these complex problems that the founders were not faced with. Sure. But the thing is, it's not that our problems are any harder than theirs. I mean, learning nuclear physics, it doesn't tell you what to do with that knowledge of nuclear physics. I'm it fully just, in It green. just simply yeah. tells you what it is. And it's this, mor it's this moral cultivation as a society that we need to have to deal with these new age problems. First of all, again, think about what I said with these, with these market failures. The market doesn't give the right incentives in those cases for people to take the right actions, to take into account the, the, the effects. Now, go back to George Washington's time or something like that, and what were the externalities? I don't know, I'm burning, I'm burning stuff in my fireplace, so there's some smoke, but it's a pretty small scale. What else? I'm throwing out garbage, maybe dumping it in the river, but it's not very much. Horses are, I mean, it was actually a serious issue in London that horses were crapping in the streets and stuff, and how do you clean that up? But this is, these are pretty small problems. They're not life-threatening. They don't, we didn't have the, the capability of wiping out life on Earth. If we aren't quite there yet, we have technology that so magnifies our power that we will have it. So how are we going to deal with that if we don't have the right incentives to do it? That's what I'm getting at. I'm not talking about wiping out the, you know, the spirit of liberty in somebody's heart or something like that. Because, no, but the because frankly, I, I, I mean, just because some of you don't know me, but I uh, would just assume right now, no, I don't want to get carried away, but I just assume right now being in Kiev fighting the Berkut or something like that, where some of my former students are. So the spirit of liberty is something that's very important to me. And I've made this argument here, but I don't see how the spirit of liberty gets me out of this problem, and this problem, and this problem. I just don't, I don't see it oh, that by itself. I think, I think that's... Uh, I, I, I'll stay here till minute. Yeah, you can, we, you, you're all free to talk to Dr. Steele um, after I officially conclude this event. But I just wanted to get a few logistical things before people start trickling out. Um, 
First off, this isn't the only sort of thing that the group does. We meet every Tuesday at 7, usually in this room. So if you liked or strongly disliked even what, what you heard tonight, please come. And if you, again, if you liked or strongly disliked what you heard at this meeting, I have a sheet, a very fancy sheet, with two columns, one labeled name, one labeled email. I think you can all figure out what it's for. So, uh, here's a pen, too. For the yes, look, this is this sort of technology that Dr. Steele was talking about. <laughs> look what we can do these days. Um, we had it past, we had it. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, where is it? Yeah, who has the... Yeah. Someone just walked off with all your emails. <laughs> okay, well, if, if that sheet missed you, come down here. And, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs>